Oh, well, worked perfectly. <laughs> Good. Um, and uh, so, hello, everyone, again. Um, I'm sure everyone already read um, Professor Kang's Wikipedia page. So I'm not going <laughs> to, because you've got a Wikipedia. I did not paper. make that. Someone made it for me. I did not make that. <laughs> it's very difficult to make Wikipedia pages. I tried to make one for myself. It wasn't really easy. Oh, OK. Easy. Yeah. I have no idea. I was, I would, you know, somebody did it and it appeared. It's, it's roughly accurate. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so Professor Kang is a professor at the University of South California. I'm, uh, I'm guessing USC. Uh -huh. Yeah, Southern and, California, uh, yeah. He is also the director of the Korean Institute in, in the University of South California, if I'm not wrong. Yes, you, uh, oh, Korean yes. Studies Institute, yes. Okay. And um, so today he's um, here with us to talk about his book, Nuclear North Korea. Um, and um, as my first question, oh, geez, wow, that's actually a pretty difficult question. Uh, okay. It doesn't really have to do much with your book, but uh, it seems like uh, one of our readers is wondering what would happen if a decapitation strike were to take place. <laughs> <laughs> wow, we're jumping right into it, aren't we? Let's get to the specifics, right? Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. It's, uh, you know, I'm too bad I can't be in person. I've never been to Italy, um, but I would love to go. So anyway, thank you for having me. And I hope all of you uh, enjoyed the book. Victor and I wrote the book to be as readable as possible about a subject that's you know often either just elites or you know sort of arcane or not well understood you know so yeah to jump into a question of decapitation strike right here's the question is it really just the leader if it is you know then we have to care about is is kim jong un crazy is he rational etc cetera, etc cetera. but frankly it's an entire country it's not clear if you got rid of Kim Jong-un, everything else would change. In fact, there's a fair amount of evidence that things aren't changing despite three different leaders. And here's the question, right? If you got a different leader in North Korea, would they be, unless you're just sort of hoping, right, dreaming, would they be more likely to not view the US as a threat? to not want to unify the peninsula on their own terms, to not want to give up power. You know, it's unlikely that you're going to get some leader that says, OK, we quit, we surrender. And so, yeah, it might have, you know, it might it might do something, but I doubt it will do as much as people think. It brings us to a more uh, question that I had, because uh, recently I read a, a Rand article on um, how to prepare the North Korean leaders for a, a, a unification. And I was just wondering what, what you thought about uh, if it was necessary or if it is possible to prepare North yeah, Korean yeah. leaders on, uh, on, on a possible reunification. I wonder, that Rand report, was it written by, oh, geez, what's his name? Anyway, that's OK. Um, <clears throat> there's two ways to think about it. And the first one is the most typical way we think about authoritarian leaders, which is, they may even want to reform. It may be that they don't want to deal with it anymore. But how can they give up power and move to a desert island somewhere and know that they'll be safe? From the leader's perspective, how can you know you're not going to get hunted down and put in jail, international criminal court, et cetera, et cetera? So leaders don't tend to, they tend to go down fighting, they go down swinging. Because there's no guarantee. They can't say, the U.S. can't credibly say to Kim Jong-un, look, if you back away, you can live in Hawaii. We'll give you an apartment. You can live out your life in peace. That doesn't tend to happen. And so they don't, right? There's a reason Saddam Hussein, et cetera, et cetera, has generally gone down swinging. The one time, the one or two times that we saw that happen was like the Soviet Union. But that country didn't go away. And so Gorbachev was able to uh, resign and still be in a country where he was basically safe, right? But many of the other leaders didn't, Ceausescu in Romania, et cetera, et cetera. They faced horrific consequences. So it's really hard to do that. I'm not sure you prepare them that way, right? Well, uh, our next question is a bit more uh, book-centric. Because okay. um, in your book, you do talk about um, 
the, the fact that a nuclear weapon is almost useless, let's put it in yeah, yeah. parentheses, <laughs> because, well, first of all, there's a THAAD battery, so I'm not sure how, how far it could go. And second of all, with conventional um, uh, batteries, well, no, normal guns, yeah. they can hit yeah. Seoul in like 56 seconds, I read. Mm -hmm. So I, I was just wondering if you could explain the, the reason why they made this nuclear weapon a bit better, or uh, not a bit better, but in yeah, a more yeah, yeah. complete way, perhaps. You know, this is actually the, the argument that some of my friends, like Victor has tried to make to the North Koreans. Nuclear weapons don't make you safer. They make you less safe because we're all worried about it. That's, that's you know, I get that, right? Here's why in some ways. A nuclear weapon is so much clearer a deterrent than a bunch of small missile batteries or conventional artillery shells. Five nuclear weapons are so much more obviously the ability of one leader to fight back. And so I can see why they do it. It's you don't have to worry about morale or feeding them or, you know, will they obey the order? It's just a bomb. You push a button and it'll go, essentially, right? And so nuclear weapons are a very clear deterrent. And what we say about nuclear weapons is they're not useful for attacking souls. They're not. Nuclear weapons are not useful. For, co for coercing anyone. You can't threaten someone and say, either you do that or I nuke you. The cost is so high, it's not realistic. The nuclear weapons are good for one thing and one thing only. They allow the loser of a war to kill the winner, right? So if North Korea is going to lose, we could invade them and blah, 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 blah. They're gonna lose the war, it's obvious, but he can still push a button and South Korea is ceases to be what it is. So they are wonderful deterrent weapons to keep someone from attacking you. Because, look, you can attack me, and you may even win, but I'll still take you down. That's a huge deterrent, the way that conventional weapons are not. And so that's the main reason that they have them. They're not very good for blackmail. It's very hard to threaten. Either you give us something, soul, or we'll wipe you off the face of the earth. It's very hard to blackmail people with nuclear weapons. So um, uh, perhaps a second question, it, it seems to follow our first question, because uh, throughout the book, you always say that, uh, both of you always say that it's, it's almost a given that uh, the US Rock Alliance or the US South Korea Alliance will win. I was just mm -hmm. wondering if you could run us through some of the, the scenarios of a, yeah. a possible war. Uh, I'm sure you've already understood that I'm a bit of a hawk. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Here, here's an example, right? Um, the main difference between 1950 and today is that the alliance is very, very clear. In 1950, the U.S. had really didn't expect to get involved in a war, had explicitly said they didn't want to get involved in a war. So Kim Il-sung in 1950 in the North could realistically think, if I invade the South, they're not ready. I can conquer it, and then the U.S. isn't going to, you know, it's going to be such a cost, they're not going to want to get involved. What he didn't realize is how quickly the U.S. changed its mind. And even then, he almost succeeded. Because if, if the North had actually uh, conquered the whole South all the way through Busan in 1950, probably the U.S. wouldn't have gotten involved in a, you know, a huge invasion to, to take over, right? But the difference today is the U.S. is guaranteed to be involved. And so there's almost no scenario you can use that the North can think realistically that they could invade Seoul and actually uh, uh, win, conquer Seoul and, and, and say, okay, we'll stop here and have a new DMZ south of Seoul. And the main reason, of course, is uh, that the South is so much richer and stronger than the North now, but the US also is as well. I'll give you an example. I don't know if I put this in the in the book because this is more recent, but the North has uh, very limited parts. Most of their tanks and planes are like literally uh, Vietnam War era, if not older. They're very, very, very old. It's like driving around a 1960s car. Parts, old, worn down, etc. And so are they going to realistically be able to take on a modern, well-trained army? Probably not. They can cause a lot of damage, but are they going to be able to fight? Probably not. 
So deterrence actually holds in a lot of ways because we don't want to take that risk and see what will happen. They realize that conquering Seoul is probably no longer an option. So both sides are like, we're tough, we're macho, don't you try it. Uh, and deterrence is actually quite stable. And we even saw that in the 2017 uh, worries when Kim was launching missiles and Trump was talking about fire and fury. Lots of talk, but nobody got close to actually starting a war because neither side really wanted to see what would happen. And that's good deterrence. The final thing I'll say about that is, the good thing about deterrence is, it's very unlikely a war is gonna actually break out. The bad part about the status quo on the Korean Peninsula is, it's really hard to move. We've been, we're stuck. We're stuck where we were in 1945 because it's very hard to move that, that border. Um, our following two questions are, are a bit strange. Um, actually, it took me quite a while to read them because the, the, the handwriting okay, is really okay. difficult to read. <laughs> the okay. first one is, why didn't, why didn't we move, uh, why didn't the South Koreans move Seoul, which is the first one, <laughs> move mm -hmm. the capital? And the second one is, why, why did the Chinese join the war in the first place? Those are both Those great are questions, great actually. actually. Right. Uh, the first one is, the Korean government has been, South Korean government has been trying to move the capital and companies outside of Seoul for the last 70 years. There have been so much effort to get Seoul not to be the center of the entire uh, uh, South Korea. So for example, there's supposed to be a new capital city, which I think you know, right? They've tried to build it and they've actually built it. Nobody wants to live there. Right? <laughs> they've tried to disperse many government facilities down to Jeju-do and you know, other places. And people will work in Jeju-do like Monday to Friday and they fly, you know, they fly down Monday morning and they go back Friday night. Nobody wants to live. They want to live in Seoul. The pull of Seoul is so big. They had in the 70s, they had all these shindoshi, you know, these new, uh, new, uh, ilsan shindoshi or whatever, you know, they tried to build new, new cap. Um, one of my cousins moved out to one of those and like 10 years later moved back, <laughs> they moved back to Seoul, right? Like, it's that's the sort of social geography of of the country that they've really tried to move Seoul so it's not such a hostage and it's just almost impossible to do right um and and we can see that in many other places like i live in los angeles at some point we know we know there will be a massive earthquake it might not be now it might be a hundred years from now, we know it's going to happen. And when it happens, people are going to say, you guys were idiots. And you know what we're going to say? Well, I thought it wouldn't happen to me. You know, um, so there's that. That's about Seoul. Why did the Chinese join? This is so fascinating. In the run up, here is the thing. In 1945, at the end of World War II, U.S. planners were absolutely convinced that Japan, which had spent the last 50 years invading other countries, was the threat. And that China was going to be a pro-U.S. capitalist democracy kind of country under the KMT. We all assumed that. Five years later, Japan's our buddy. <laughs> and China is now red China. 1949 changed almost everything when the Chinese Communist Party actually kicked the uh the Guomindang, the uh the nationalist or the you know the sort of capitalist forces off the off the mainland to taiwan nobody thought that was going to happen nobody thought these peasants from western china were ever going to have a chance but they did and all of a sudden the whole world is different so korea which had not been that important now became incredibly important because we didn't want China and Russia, you know, Soviet Union to be big. On the Chinese side, the Chinese didn't want to get involved in a war, but they weren't gonna let the US have the Korean Peninsula as a clearly um, opposed to the uh, Chinese Communist Party. There was no way they were gonna let the US uh, uh, unify the peninsula and be a stronghold to 
to uh, cause problems for China. And the Chinese made very clear that they saw Korea as their own interests. And they sent envoys through India because we weren't talking to them. We're like, we don't recognize you. You're not a real country. So we had no diplomacy. If through India, through their ambassador to India, they told the Indian ambassador, tell the Americans, we are not going to let them win the whole war. And MacArthur didn't believe them. MacArthur actually wanted to use nuclear weapons in China. He thought, ah, they're just bluffing until they attacked. Um, and it's very, very clear. They were not going to let that happen. So big miscalculation on MacArthur's part. Uh, I actually read an article that said um, it's impossible to defend the North Korean border with uh, in-depth defense or conventional mil military defenses. Um, so th that practically means that if uh, South Korea is an American ally, the Koreas yeah. will never unite in a certain sense. I'm not sure what you think about this part or this uh, aspect. They could. No, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 north, the north, the northern the north. border from the Amnok, you know, the Yalu River uh, has always been essentially during wintertime, you can just walk across. It's always been a wild frontier. Uh, you know, this is where Manchus and Uyghurs, not Uyghurs, you know, Manchus and Khitan and Jurchens, right? It's always been a, a sort of frontier land. Um, it is extremely hard to build a border across mountainous, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, you can't defend it really well. The best way to do it though, and what has always happened with China has been, Korea has been always neutral or at least somewhat uh, sympathetic to China, right? 1592, when the Japanese invaded Korea, the Chinese came to help the Koreans. So the Koreans have always had a pretty good relationship with mainland China. The, 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 the possible future is a unified Korea that has good relations with China. As long as it's not seen as a US puppet, I don't think the Chinese would mind. I think the Chinese know how to handle a Korea. The Koreans, like with the Thad battery, they know how to push against China. They know how to live with each other. The task is how do you do that? First of all, you gotta get rid of the North Korean regime, but let's assume that happens. How do you unify? and have a sort of sympathetic or neutral Korea or a, you know, and that is that is not easy at all because the U.S., as much as we, uh, the U.S., we, you know, have, have troops in Korea to help Korea, it also helps American interests. So the U.S. is not going to easily give up that, you know, that, that position right there. So it's another reason that we're sort of stuck. We are stuck. And that is a tragedy of the Korean Peninsula. It is the only place in the world where the Cold War still exists. And that's a tragedy. If there was an easy answer, we would have done it. <laughs> um, so um, uh, perhaps one of my, my, the last questions would be, um, well, perhaps you almost answered it, but it's uh, in what scenario do you see the Koreas uniting? Yeah. yeah. But we almost that, answered that, it. I'm not sure if you yeah. want to add something on. Let me, let me put it this way. I think the answer is something along the lines of a China-Taiwan model. Now, it's easy for us to talk about Taiwan. Right now, there's a lot of chatter, uh, you know, about, oh, Taiwan, is it is it in danger or something like that? But of the two contested countries, right, like divided countries, say, in East Asia, China, Taiwan, Korea, North and South Korea, the China-Taiwan relationship is much more stable. <laughs> There's trade going back and forth, there's invest, there's direct flights, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's not, it's not solved, but there is a much more stable equilibrium between China and Taiwan. And why? There's basic reason, which is the Chinese side, about 20 years ago or so, decide, 25 years ago now, decided to stop pressuring and threatening Ch Taiwan, and instead said, we're open for business. And it was the Taiwanese side that originally tried to limit economic relations. Like for a long time, you couldn't fly directly to China. You had to go through Hong Kong, right? They weren't gonna let it. And eventually it became too much to, you couldn't, the Taiwanese government, either side, uh, uh, DPP or um, KMT, couldn't stop. And they had to allow direct, there was just too much pressure for direct flight. The Chinese side has said, Taiwan can do essentially whatever it wants, have its own currency, have its own government, 
have its own flag, but they can't call themselves an independent nation. And as long as they don't do that, things are pretty stable, roughly, right? That's very different from the Korean side, where as you know, you can't even call, talk, walk, visit, or whatever else, right? And the answer is, so the answer in some ways, the first step towards it is somehow getting beyond the idea that there should be one nation, so to speak, and accepting sort of one nation, two systems, or whatever else, right? Like. If it's a I win, you lose, then probably nothing is going to happen, right? Because both sides are entrenched. Um, and so is there a way to start doing some of this smaller stuff? I don't know, right? We haven't in seven years, we haven't done it. I've started to say my, my answer is different from even from the book now, because I've started to write, you know, North Korea is not a problem to be solved. We're not going to solve the problem. It's a country we have to live with. I mean, realistically, we are living with it, right? And so how do we manage a relationship with it that might sort of loosen some of these ties a little bit? Um, but yeah, this is a really, really difficult uh, uh, issue. There aren't, I can't tell you, nobody can tell you this much pressure, this much carrots, this much sticks, and we'll problem solve. That's, it's not gonna happen that way. Um, and that's truly a tragedy. So can we do smaller things underneath that, underneath solving it? Can we do smaller things that allow a little bit of interaction or trade or communication back and forth would still make things better than they are today? Actually, um, a friend of mine tried to call one of the Egyptian companies that installed the, the, the cell phones in, uh, Arascom, yeah, in North yeah. Korea. Yeah. It's actually impossible to call them. It's, yeah. it's, yeah, I don't know, uh, very interesting anyway. <laughs> uh, we were wondering as a, as a last question, how would you update your book if you were to yeah. rewrite it? Or what would you write differently if you were to write it today? Well, we had a second version a couple years ago, right? Um, 2018, I think. Yeah, yeah, which is too bad because I would have loved to include all the Trump things. Here's, here's, the, here's one reason it's actually, it's good for me and it's bad for Korea. Things haven't changed that much, right? The book is still relevant and the arguments are still relevant because we're having the same debates today that we were having 20 years ago, right? So there's not that much I would update. There really isn't, right? Other than I'm actually in some ways a little more pessimistic. I re when I wrote the book, I really thought Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong-il, he's, you know, if he goes, things might change. He, he died, his son took over. You know, we have these endless debates about, is he in charge? Is he weak? Is he strong? He's still there. It's been almost 10 years now, right? Like, so it's really, it is a, it is sad. It's, I don't want to be dramatic, but it is a tragedy that things have really not changed that much. We're having the same debate. Yeah. Um, I think that was the last question. Um, I just wanted to tell you that I think it was Bruce Bennett. And uh, that was well, yeah. so much fun. Thank you so much. Oh, Thank well, you so I'm, much I'm delighted you had me. Good, great. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed the book and to uh, hear from you guys in the future. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Bye.